Well, good morning. So this conference I was at this last week was actually at the church that uh, made that little video practicing the way. They, for several years, have been teaching people how do we learn to walk with Jesus the way his disciples did? What does that look like in the 21st century and how do we do it well? And they have invited churches to join them in this endeavor. And for the last two years, we as a church have been trying. If you were here the last few weeks, maybe you've heard me talk about things like being with Jesus and becoming like him and doing what Jesus himself did. See, we believe in this place that everything we do is for one purpose and one purpose only, to connect the disconnected to a growing and reproducing relationship with Jesus. And what that means is you and I, in our sinfulness, have been at one point disconnected from God, unplugged from the source of life that gives us strength and energy and comfort and peace, and it is our sinfulness that has kept us disconnected. And maybe in your story, it was the sinfulness of other people that pushed you there. You were a part of a church that was filled with all kinds of unrepented sin where they said and they did really hurtful things that looked nothing like Jesus. And you said, if that's what it means to be a Christian, I want nothing to do with it. And maybe in your story, you have found that in your life, you want to follow Jesus, but this world is just really hard and things are really difficult, and you don't really know, what do I do next? And so what we believe in this church is that you and I, once far from God, have been invited to come and draw near, not by our strength and our energy and by being perfect, but by simply confessing that we are broken and in need of him. And we believe that a growing relationship with Jesus is one that starts where you are, Really honestly, don't try to be somebody you're not or act like you're better than you are. Just be honest with yourself and with others. Come exactly as you are. But that's where we start. And every day, every one of us is invited to move beyond that. To come as we are and slowly in this journey with Jesus to become somebody altogether new. Somebody made in his image and created to be with him. And as we spend time with the creator of the universe, we become like him. And it changes how we think and how we feel and what we do. And so as a church, we have uh, several different times stopped for a season to dive into what is one practice or habit you and I can begin to do to become more like Jesus and to do the things he did. And this one we're starting today that we'll spend the next several weeks in, I'm really excited for. Because what we're starting today is a practice called eating and drinking. Anybody in here like to eat or drink? A lot? With people sometimes? Okay, fewer of you with people. That, we'll get there, all right? But eating and drinking can be such a source of joy. Like, I really love good food. I'm terrible at making it but I love to eat it. And I love really good drink, and I will be your best friend if you have really good food or drink. In fact, the way to my heart is most certainly through my stomach. And I would say for most people that's probably true, whether we're willing to admit it or not. There's something about eating and drinking with other people that has a profound power to completely change who we are and how we feel, and in turn, how we live. It's a wonderful thing. And so over the next several weeks, we're gonna talk about how can you and I begin to practice eating and drinking with purpose, all right? It's one thing to eat and drink on your own, that sustains your body. But when you eat and drink with other people on purpose, that'll sustain your soul. Now, to get there though, as we begin this practice, I just have to be really upfront. I might offend you, all right? Because eating and drinking, when we do it the way Jesus did, the way he taught, is not simply sharing a meal with our friends and people we like. Actually, eating and drinking the way Jesus taught it requires you and I to purposefully sit down with people we have nothing in common with. And sometimes that's not only really uncomfortable, it's borderline offensive. How dare you ask me or expect me to do that? 
Now, I need to give a preface, though, as we dive into this practice. I expect over the next several weeks, each of you will eat and drink, okay? But you are free to not participate in doing something different than you already have. This is not a command that if you don't do this, you can't walk with Jesus. This is not a command that says you need to do this for God to love you. This is purely an invitation. Imagine if your life could be filled with purpose and joy and family and community like you've never known before. If that sounds really exciting, join us in this practice. And the first way that we're gonna have to learn to eat and drink differently is to begin to think about our houses differently. How many of you have a place where you lay your head at night? Okay, that's, that's a lot of you. Jesus did not, so you guys are already not like Jesus, all right? But in a more practical way, we have places we call home, and maybe you know the answer to this statement, right? Every man's house is his castle. I heard a couple of you say that. Right? We have this American mentality Largely this Western mentality that says my house is a place of retreat. It's a fortress I run to, there I am safe. And how many of you, let's be honest, if you went home today could sneak into your house without talking to any of your neighbors? And it would be awesome. And you could sit down and you could watch whatever you wanted, binge watch it all day long. Maybe that's the NFL, maybe that's Netflix. You could do whatever you want, not talking to a single other person except for those pesky kids you live with, but you can send them away too eventually, right? And then you're free to go to bed in the comfort of your own bed, having spent the whole day in your own head by yourself. Doesn't that sound like a beautiful place to be? For all you introverts, like, yes, can I have more of that? Well, yeah, I think there's a time and a place for that. But our our Western mindset views our home as a retreat and escape from the world. And so we close our doors and we shut our blinds and we pull into our garages if we have them and we don't talk to anybody around us because there we're safe. And yet, despite our fortress and our castle and our safety, we as Americans are more lonely now than we've ever been before. We're more anxious now than we've ever been before. More depressed now than we've ever been before. Perhaps our castle is slowly crippling us. I believe that as we begin to eat and drink with others and we learn what hospitality looks like, Jesus begins to move through that to change not only how we view the people around us, but he begins to change how we feel about ourselves in this very world we live in. We're going to begin today in Luke chapter 19. I invite you to follow along with me. Luke chapter 19 is a story many of you are probably familiar with. It's a man named named Zacchaeus. Anybody ever heard of the name Zacchaeus? Maybe from that kid's song, he was a wee little man who climbed a tree, right? Zacchaeus was a tax collector, a filthy, horrible sinner who the Jewish people viewed as a traitor and the Roman people viewed as a dog beneath them. So he was hated by his own people and hated by the people who were over him in leadership. Generally hated. And what we see in Luke 19 is Zacchaeus was not just a tax collector who was hated. He openly admits he was prone to cheating people and stealing their money. And how many of us are best friends with somebody who will openly admit they like to steal your stuff? Anyone? A couple of us. All right. Shane, I hope somebody stealing my table saw is not what you're referring to. All right. He loaned me a saw and then it disappeared and now I bought him a new one, unfortunately. So here we go, Luke chapter 19, beginning in verse five. Jesus is wandering down the road and Zacchaeus is up in the tree because he's tiny, he's trying to see Jesus. And here we go. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down for I must stay at your house today. I love the boldness of Jesus, right? He just invites himself over to Zacchaeus' house like it's no big deal. Hey, by the way, I'm going to sleep on your couch tonight. I hope you don't mind. How many of you would be open to that most of the time, right? Just somebody walking down the street saying, hey, I'm sleeping on your couch. Anyway, I digress. So, So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. 
Zacchaeus was super excited. Jesus has invited him, or more importantly, has asked to be invited to his house. Zacchaeus is super, super stoked. And we see when they saw it, they being all the crowd, they all grumbled. See, if you're familiar with the story, the Jewish people were really, really opposed to people like Zacchaeus who were sinners. And there's a good reason for it. And and to understand that reason, we've got to back up a little bit to the Old Testament. Maybe you're familiar with how the story unfolds. God has rescued his people. He's chosen his people. They're to be a light to the whole world. He gives them these great promises. He asks them to follow him. And then what do they do? They just repeatedly turn away and chase after other gods. And God warns them. He says, look, these other gods, these other idols, they will leave you empty and unfulfilled. I promise, come to me. I will give you rest. I will be your source of joy. Come and be with me. And they just keep chasing other gods and other things. And so he warns, he says, this will lead to great destruction. In fact, you will be taken from your land and from your houses and forced into exile. And you will be placed in communities where you don't know anyone, where you aren't able to do the things you want to do and given foods you don't want to eat. It will be miserable. Trust me. Come back to me. And they don't. So they get taken into exile and their temple gets destroyed. And for the Jewish people, the temple was really, really important because it was there in the temple where God had promised his presence to dwell. And so if they had sinned and they wanted to be forgiven, it was there in the temple where they brought their sacrifices to God. And in these sacrifices that were uh, killed and then cooked and then even eaten together, forgiveness was experienced. Now they were living in a foreign land, in a world that looked nothing like they believed in, in a culture that hated their God, and they were in a difficult place. God said we could meet him in the temple, and now we don't have a temple. How do we meet with God and be forgiven without the place he promised? And so there was a shift that happened in the Jewish culture. The priests at the time said, well, what do we do in this case? How do we begin to to worship God and connect with him when we don't have the place we were expecting? And they said, "It's, it's really simple. We don't have an altar to make sacrifices on, but we have a table that we eat at. So the table will take the place of the altar. And we don't have priests, but we have fathers. So the head of the household, he will act as a priest for each individual household there at the table. And on top of this, The meal that we eat will take the place of the sacrifice. And the culture shifted for Jewish people because they could not worship the way they wanted to, because they couldn't gather in the temple, because the place where they thought God would dwell was gone. They said, now in this meal that we share together, that's where we will meet with God and be forgiven, and it'll be okay. Now, this is really, really important because a few hundred years later when Jesus comes on the scene, there's still a desperate longing for God to restore everything they once had. And the Jewish people, especially the religious leaders called Pharisees, believed with everything in them, if all the people of Israel for one day could be sinless, could do the right thing for one day, If all the people could, then God would restore us to this life of peace and prosperity and freedom. So take the table and this idea that God would restore everybody if they were for one day sinless. And you put these things together and it is a ripe climate. See, if the table was the place where you met with God, if the meal shared was the place you experienced his forgiveness, You could only share that meal with people who were right with God, people who were walking with God. So to eat with sinners was fundamentally going against your vision of God someday restoring everything. Because by eating with sinners, you would in turn become a sinner like them. Jesus comes to Zacchaeus and he says, today I'm going to come to your house and I'm going to stay with you. And all the people grumbled. Jesus, don't you know this man? Like he's, he's actually working against the very things we're in favor of. We want God to restore everything and you're gonna spend time with him? Hold Zacchaeus in your mind and flip back a few chapters to Matthew chapter seven. 
some disciples from John the Baptist come to him. And they're asking, Jesus, are you really the one? Are you the one we should hope for? And Jesus responds, and then he sends them away. And this is what he says in verse 33. For John the Baptist has come eating no bread and drinking no wine. And you say, he has a demon. John practiced fasting. He committed to similar practices that they were used to, habits and customs, things they believed would help people be closer to God. And yet they looked at John and said, clearly that man's possessed because he's weird. And then Jesus says this, and the son of man has come eating and drinking. And you say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Your wisdom is justified by all her children. Jesus says, look, if those who practice fasting and holiness and righteous things are considered bad, and those who seem to do the opposite are considered bad, then what? So then he continues with this example, a real story of Jesus proving everything upside down. One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner When she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. Now, catch that. Here's the story we're entering into. A Pharisee who believes if you eat with sinless people, you will be a sinless people, invites Jesus in, come and eat at my place, and Jesus freely goes. And while they're there, a woman who was a sinner known about the city really kind way of saying a woman who probably had a lot of sexual partners, maybe made some money doing it. This woman comes in to a Pharisee's house. She takes a jar of ointment or perfume and standing behind him, that is behind Jesus, at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair, of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. All not only very weird and kind of gross to our culture, but all an act of honor and also an act of approach. Let me be with you and together with you and a part of what you're doing. This sinner comes to Jesus and begins to treat him with this great honor and reverence in the house of a Pharisee. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, say it, teacher. A certain money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii, so 500 days wages, a little over a year and a half, and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, the one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you have judged rightly. Now picture the scene. Like just for a moment, here's a Pharisee who's trying to do what is right, who's invited a holy man into his house, who's now being defiled by the touch of a very sinful woman, not even just a privately one, one everybody knows. Don't you know who she is? And this Pharisee's conflicted. I know what scripture says. I know what I've always been taught. I want to follow God. And this man in front of me is not. Jesus tells a story. Who do you think will be more thankful? And I wonder if the Pharisee, upon hearing this, looked at the woman and paused for a moment before he responded. Just thinking of the weight of what Jesus was saying, obviously the one forgiven much. Jesus says, you have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house, and you gave me no water for my feet. 
a very simple and basic uh, act of hospitality. See, back then they had dirt roads that had lots of animals traveling to and fro, and most people didn't have great closed-toed shoes. And so when you walked down the street, your feet would get covered in dirt and dust and all kinds of filth. And so if you entered into a house with filthy feet, they were supposed to be washed by the lowest of servant in the house so that you could come into the house clean and made whole before you sit down to eat. This Pharisee, Jesus says, never even gave him water for his feet. The basics of hospitality he neglected. The basics of caring for another's needs he was too busy for. He says, you gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, a common greeting, a kiss on the cheek, one that says we are family and together. You gave me no kiss. But she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore I tell you her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? But he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. We have this story of one who should be welcoming and hospitable, and he gives none of that. And we have one who should be nothing of the righteous and good and hospitable kind. And she gives all of that. Jesus says, which one of you has received more? The one who forgives much will love, or who's been forgiven much will love much. So for just a moment, I want to flash forward now back to Zacchaeus in Luke 19, all right? Zacchaeus is invited into, or Jesus invites himself over to Zacchaeus' house. And all the people grumble, and so Zacchaeus replies. He replies by saying he's going to make right everybody he's cheated. He's going to fix what he's done wrong. And Jesus says this to him. Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of man, or son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and save the lost. There's something really awesome about the way Luke writes. This phrase, the son of man came, Luke uses twice. The first one, Luke chapter 7, what we just looked at. The son of man came eating and drinking. And now he says the son of man came to save the lost. See, there's a reason for that. Jesus' mission was to seek and save the lost. And here in the South, we sometimes think about the lost as like those really bad sinners, right? Those people that I shouldn't associate with, they are lost. Anybody ever been hiking and been lost? You're not necessarily sinful because you're lost. You're just confused and don't know the right direction. You're stumbling as best you can trying to find the right way and you don't yet know it. When Jesus says those who are lost, that he's come to save, to seek and save the lost. He's looking for those who are confused and stumbling and desperately in need of direction. And how is it that he accomplishes this mission? By eating and drinking. See, this is why this meal is so important for us. The practice of hospitality is how we join Jesus on his mission to do his work for the sake of those who are lost. We eat and drink with sinners or those whose way is confused and their path isn't clear. And we do so with love and with grace. Now this word hospitality that we have come to use in the English language to describe hosting somebody, this word hospitality we find in scripture in several places. I'm gonna share just two of them with you now. First, the one I'm gonna share is 1 Peter chapter 4, verse nine. Here's what it says. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. This is Peter writing to the church, to Christians. How do you love like Jesus? Show hospitality without grumbling. Just see what happens. 
And this Greek word here for hospitality is philo xenoe, which comes from xenophilia. And maybe you know two of those words and the way they've been used in English. Xeno referring to other and outsider and stranger. And philia, like Philadelphia, meaning love. Hospitality is the love of a stranger, of an outsider, of someone else. Show hospitality without grumbling. And then again in Hebrews chapter 13, it says this, let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. Let love, brotherly love continue. Do not neglect hospitality. See, in our American culture, we're actually not that much different than the Pharisees of old. They believed meals were to be shared with those who were closest to them, those who were good friends, who they trusted, who they were like, whose lives reflected who they wanted to be. And they excluded everyone else. And we often in our castles at home do just the same. Maybe I'll invite a close friend over for a meal, but I'm probably too busy binge watching whatever I wanna watch. Maybe I'll invite somebody into my house, but if I do, I have to put on a face. I can't be myself, right? Like, let's be honest, who has ever chosen not to invite somebody over because your house was too messy? Anybody? Or because you don't know what to cook? Or because, like, honestly, it's just exhausting to be around people, and I just, I don't really want that right now. Right? Some people are like, all three, I'll check the box. That's just life. And you and I are prone in our American way to say, I don't really need to do that. It's not that important. And yet Jesus invites every one of us to practice hospitality, a love of the stranger, a love of the other, to invite people into our lives to share a meal. Now, anybody in here, Martha Stewart or like that caliber of cooking? Any of you, a couple of you can cook that well? I've been to a few of your houses and you can cook that well. I cannot. If you come to my house and my wife's not cooking, you will be served mac and cheese or a hot dog from the grill. That's about the extent of my skill level. And for many of us, because we think we have to have it all perfect and have just the perfect event and moment and experience, we just don't do it at all because we don't know how to do that. You know, the hospitality of Scripture that Jesus demonstrated and invites us into actually invites you to stop caring about getting it right. So what if you invite people over and the meal sucks? And you try something and it burns. There's always pizza. Like you can always invite people over and be like, this failed, can I order a pizza? What do you like, right? If you invite somebody over and the meal's horrible, I invited some people over this, this spring and it taken us four years to finally get together and like make it happen. And we have a meal and I undercooked the chicken and somehow managed to catch my grill on fire in the process. Great quality job, Adam. And yet we had a wonderful time because something about eating and drinking with people connects to our soul. It feeds more than our body, but our very livelihood. Jesus invites us into radical hospitality. And this hospitality is actually not anything spectacular. There's a book called The Gospel Comes with a House Key, uh, all about a woman who was completely against Jesus, very much set in her ways, thought the Christians were the problem with this world, and she wrote a scathing article all about how terrible Christians were. And a pastor who she had referenced in the article just reached out and said, hey, do you want to come over for dinner? And she came over really not sure what she was getting into, really like dead set against it. I'm going to prove him wrong. I'm going to have more material for later. And was just so blown away by how ordinary and loving he was. She kept coming back and ended up becoming a Christian herself just by his, as she put it, radically ordinary hospitality. You don't need to put on a face and be something you're not. Just invite people to come and eat and drink. And when they're there, be real. If the food's not very good, that's it's okay. If, if you want to step up and say, look, I don't have anything fancy, but here's what it is, that's okay. If your house is a little messy, that's okay. Because it shows that you are real and you care beyond the experience people have. 
and beyond the really put together perfect life. You just care about others. If you and I begin to practice radically ordinary hospitality, just eating and drinking with people who maybe otherwise we wouldn't be friends with, or maybe otherwise we would never take the time to go out of our way to say, come into my life and be a part of what I'm doing. We will begin to see Jesus move in our midst because his mission is to seek and save the lost, but his method is to eat and drink with sinners, to be with those who are far from God and simply show them how much they're loved. As we start this practice this week, if you're in a connect group each week, you're going to be receiving a new practical thing you can do to try this practice. And if you're not in a connect group, those will be available online later today, and you'll be able to practice it on your own. But here's what it is for this week. If you want to become more like Jesus and do what he did, take some time this week to pray about one person or maybe one family that you should invite over to dinner. That's it. And then the second half of that is invite them over to dinner. And it's really okay if their schedules and your schedules are such that dinner doesn't happen for another month. But put it on the calendar now so that it does happen in a month. That simple practice will begin for you and I to begin shifting the way we see people around us and changing things. And maybe you're like, I have a really small apartment. How can I ever invite somebody over for dinner? Well, be like Jesus. Invite yourself over to their house. Right? Hey, I'm coming to your place and I'll bring dinner. What day works? That's fine. Or or maybe you're like, I just, I don't really know about how I can invite somebody over because I feel really uncomfortable in private spaces. So invite them out to a public space, meet them for coffee or take them to lunch. Just get together and share a meal without any agenda. There's no need to like preach to them or tell them all about Jesus or my pastor told me I have to get together with you so here I am. Just do it. And if you don't know what to say, the best thing you can do with somebody is just ask questions about them. Because I don't know if you know this, people like to talk about themselves. Ask questions about them that show you genuinely care and are interested and the chances are all the awkward silence will be filled by somebody saying something. And you'll learn a lot about somebody maybe you didn't know much about before. As we endeavor to practice the very things Jesus did, we're going to start with eating and drinking. And with radically ordinary hospitality, I believe we'll see the lost get saved, and you and I will find life that we've never known before. Will you pray with me? God, we thank you. We thank you that you came eating and drinking to save the lost to seek and save those who are disconnected and far from you. We thank you that we were once far from you and you have brought us near. God, as we begin to try to do the very things you did, give us courage to try something new. Give us peace when it fails. Help us to know that this practice is one of growing and not of getting it right. And if we have the most extremely terrible meal with love and kindness and genuine hospitality, you'll still work even through that. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.